with the WSSD MSY targets are um, not consistent with the biology of all the animals to which they refer. In fact, the Marine Strategy Directive, um, which I know in some detail, has some words in there to basically say that the targets will take account of the biology of the animals. But, I mean, of course, I, I, the way I see policy now, I mean, there's a great move towards setting timelines and everybody thinks of smart management objectives and things, but... I mean, A, biology doesn't work like that, and already our record based on commitments at CBD, WSSD, etc., um, you know, shows that we haven't made great progress in hitting these targets. But I imagine some of the people making the decisions feel it's important to have something time-bound there because it sort of focuses society's interests. And I mean, certainly now in the case of the 2010 biodiversity target in the UK, we're seeing a vast amount of activity um, because everybody wants to know whether we whether we met it or not, um, and I guess in that sense, having a deadline is a, is a good thing. But yes, the biology can't always follow. Please. Yeah, um, I, I'm not sure if you uh, in the talk you had uh, the group had decided to change the objectives because I saw you now have an excellent vision. But when I looked at your original objectives, you chose three, and the first one was uh, maximum sustainable yield on all targeted species, and the next one was all other components of the ecosystem are excellent or something to that effect. <laughs> Those seem mutually exclusive to me. In fact, if, you know, all the discussion that we've had today would indicate that you may only be able to maintain maximum sustainable yield on one or two or three targeted species, and then the rest will have to be lower in order to address the excellent ecosystem. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean, two things. One is that they're, um, the, the aspiration you see relates to the plans for the 2012 revision, the objectives you see relate to the 2002 revision. Um, that's the first point. The second point is the um, reference to ecosystem status isn't too excellent. It's to just achieving good ecological status. And that could be defined on the basis of um, sustainability um, in the same way it might be defined in terms of preservation. It hasn't actually been done as yet. But yes, there are trade-offs, of course. Yeah. Thank you. I, I think we're going to have to move on. Uh, thank you so much. We have the pleasure and honor of introducing uh, Jason Link now, who comes to us from NOAA, National Marine Fisheries Service, and uh, where he's working as a program leader in Food Web Dynamics program as a research fisheries uh, biologist. His principal interest being fish feeding ecology, fisheries, and ecosystem management, large aquatic marine ecosystems, uh, pelagic communities, ecological modeling, and has been published uh, widely. And for example, one paper with the title, Translation of Ecosystem Indicators into Decision Criteria. Thank you very much, Jason. Thank you, Pat. Uh, thank you, too. To Tim and Andre for the invite. Um, before I start, can everyone hear me in the back of the room adequately? Okay. Uh, the other thing before I jump into this, I want to uh, acknowledge several of my uh, colleagues and collaborators, some of whom are in the room, uh, some of whom are at the center of world postdocs. Folks like Bill Overholtz, Mike Fogarty, uh, Vivian Tyrell, Hassan Mustafa, and so forth. They, they contribute a lot to this. The other thing I want to know before I start is it's, uh, it's about 4.15, 4.20 local time. A lot of you are probably tired, I would guess. A lot of you are probably having brain freeze of all the information today. So I at least have tried to put in some funny pictures and some cute quotes. And I say that just so you'll pay attention to these <laughs> seagulls. So, um, yeah. Um, about six or seven years ago at a boat symposium, I flashed this slide. You know, we've been talking about ecosystem-based fisheries management. What in the wide world of sports does that mean? What are we trying to do? All these principles and blah, blah. And now we're to how. And I flagged the, this slide, as I said, uh, half a decade ago or more. And it's interesting for me to revisit that question. How do we actually implement this? from a global perspective, listening to all of you and the discussions we've had today, but also to go back in our system and, and situation and see how, how are we doing this? Where are we going? You know, how is it working? So what I like to do is give you a bit of conceptual underpinnings, talk about the scientific or technical basis 
of where I think we're putting a lot of our, our energies of how to do this. And then very briefly, and as best as I can, talk about some institutional and organizational type things and try to wrap that up and keep you all awake and paying attention to the quotes. So, um, th this is the main theme. So I, I think we're really trying to address trade-offs uh, in this whole business. And you know that's the text, but this is what it's all about. Um, <laughs> what? Uh, no. Uh, what you see here is we have Flipper, and then we can have Fishburger, and and really, you know, if this is the ecosystem, do we need to take a slice out of the pie and set it aside so Flipper is happy, and then maybe get a piece of the pie, coconut cream, by the way, and, and um, have that so that everybody can have a piece of the ecosystem sustainably, yada, yada, yada. So you get the point. That's what we're all about. And, and I think, here's a cool quote, I'm gonna just say it's, it's a cool quote that really underlies my philosophy. Have you read it yet? Or I'll keep reading. All right. Um, so anyways, the, the thing that's important from my perspective before we start is there's three kinds of management advice. There's heroism. You know, understanding how ecosystems function, the structure, that type of thing. Understanding the relative importance of different processes. And we've talked about triage of, uh, you know, bottom up, top down, oceanography versus fishing, ecology versus social dynamics, all that stuff. And, and we're really trying to advance scientific theory. And, and oftentimes, as, as pointy headed science geeks, we try to understand this, and this is where we sink our teeth into. And classically in fisheries management, we're talking tactical management. You know, where we're revising stock assessments, we're providing yield adjustments or TAC adjustments, whatever, and the reference points associated with that. And in an EBFM context, we're looking at not only direct impacts on target stocks, but other critters as well, as you see listed there. And, and this is very specific. What if scenarios, what is the TAC for next year? What is the quota for uh, the next couple of years, something like that. And it's binding in scope, and we're familiar with these. Uh, the challenge, I think, with an EBFM uh, consideration is the strategic management advice. And this really is where we're trying to assess these biomass trade-offs and explore system-level emergent properties. How does the system function as a whole? Maybe evaluate these different steady states. I'm told on this coast there's this thing called the PDO and regime shifts and stuff like that. So anyways, <laughs> things like that to consider. And really, you know, the big things, as Jake mentioned earlier this morning, uh, these long-term recruitment bottlenecks. And these are much more generic or general what-if scenarios. And they're not so much, you know, this is this year's quota, but they're, hey, is this feasible? Is this not feasible? They're bounding in scope. Now, here's my quote. Fisheries scientists give heuristic advice. Fisheries managers want tactical advice. And most of the time, strategic advice is what is needed. So the reason I flag that is the types of models, the types of approaches that I'm going to show you here in the next few moments. Where are we going to apply them? What kinds of questions are we going to address them to? What does that advice do along the gradient of possibilities and, and questions that we have to address. So this is the gradient of possibilities. You can see we have you know, the classical single species stuff all the way up to these messy pictures that Billy and a lot of us do. And then you know, a range of things along here. And you can basically ignore ecosystem issues, and that happens. Uh, you can do multiple single species assessments in harmony. Uh, that's not e-harmony, that, that's just you know, getting together and walking down the hall and making sure things are, are jiving with, with other folks. And what we're doing a lot, and I'm seeing more and more of, is adding basically other stuff, predation, habitat, whatever, into these assessments as another source of mortality, as another source of removals, impacts to growth, whatnot. And then these multi-species assessments, aggregate assessments, and whole system models. And, and you can have heurism at any place along here. Most of your tactical information is on this level, although there are a couple aggregate models that can give you tactical outputs. And then your strategic stuff tends to be more here, biophysics and so on. So I want to keep that in mind and then give you a few examples of what we're doing in the Northeast US um, of approaches we're trying and, and to be very 
uh, frank and forthright about how well, not only we feel that we're doing scientifically, but how well our management institutions and those structures are taking up the information to give you that perspective. Um, so this is a quote to remind me that I'm now going to talk about what we're doing. So you read it by now, I guess. So, all right. Um, one of the things is single species add-ons. And basically, this is where we're making our hay. We're doing a lot of these, and we're incorporating these into stock assessments. Uh, some of you have reviewed these for us, uh, where we're looking at primarily predation type things, uh, more uh, environmental cues. And, and really, that's critical for forage species. Um, but the, the two key points here is it's still pretty slow uptake kinetics in the overall management process. It takes a long time to vet the model, to have people like Jake come in and kick the tires and say, you know, you can be considered this or that. And, and then the other thing is, generally speaking, uh, I think probably categorically, if you look at this example, something that Bill Overholtz and I, I did a while ago, uh, where we were projecting at the time, if you just do a standard access assessment and ignore predation, you get one answer. When you include predation, you have lower yield by you know, a factor of 10 to 15 percent. And that's not always the most popular thing to say. So that might be why it hasn't plugged in. So let me run, run through probably the bulk of my examples would be the single species add-ons, extended stock assessment models, minimum realistic models, whatever you want to call them, but stuff that we're probably more familiar with with a few other elements. And here's an example again that uh, Bill Overholtz and I did and what you can see, we recreated some, some histories going back to the late 50s. And fishing mortality was whacking these species until we had the, the uh, EEZ established and kind of kicked out the foreign fleets. Coincident with that, there was a lot of other ground fish and so on. And the mortality, predation mortality on herring was also high. And those two, that, that joint mortality, kind of knocked down the, the stock and it was, uh, took a long time to recover and it didn't start recovering until the, the later uh, mid 90s or so I should say. And, and what you see now currently is as you look through this trajectory and as we've projected even further, uh, the predation mortality is at least two to three times higher than the fishing mortality. And we often have been doing these assessments and not including this, and yet this is a huge source of removal and mortality. It kind of dawned on us that we probably ought to do that. But again, bringing it into the process has been, been slow and challenging. Another example, um, I think you were at this one, but the, uh, the uh, Pandala shrimp, uh, northern shrimp in our Gulf of Maine system, Pandalus borealis, um, has a, a model, and, and they were running this model here, this what are, am I allowed to say puke green? Is that okay? Anyways, this, this green line here was the model with a mortality of 0.25. And we came in with this purple line right here that was effectively saying, look, let's take our data, empirical data, run it through a simple model, and calculate how much was removed by predators that at a minimum had to have been in the ecosystem. And it was four to five times higher than what the model was estimating. Again, not a real popular thing to, to do. Um, but ultimately what we said was, hey, let's maybe run the model with a mortality of you know, 0.5 or 0.6. And it, it tended to then match up with an empirical backstopping to what we thought was going on with this stock. And we couldn't understand with this model why the stock was going up, where in fact, we, when we had these, this accounted for this higher biomass that was out there, it helped us to understand the dynamics of this. So this has been through uh, a SARC and so forth. Another example is including menhaden uh, with and without predation. And just back casting, what you see is without predators, uh, there was a lot less that was out there than if you include predators in a back casting sense, which also has huge ramifications for reference points and projections and so on. Uh, but the other thing, I think this is age one, when you get to age two, and, and we have to be very forthright about this, who cares? You know, so they grow out of that predation window. So we're looking at that. Uh, here's another one we looked at 
uh, with Lalago squid, um, long fin squid, and you take the ratio of B to BMSY and you don't have predators, and you know it's not doing great, but more and more than not, it's it's above the reference point. When you add in predation and account for the fact that those other removals were not looking as good. And, and again, trying to get this into the process without upsetting the apple cart and so forth has been a challenge. But we're doing this just to show proof of concept research model run through, and we're trying to step through it in baby steps ultimately so that this could be taken up. Um, I do mention this is some work John Hare has been doing. Uh, we've taken an IPCC model, stepped it down globally to, I think it's some estuary near Virginia, um, not the Chesapeake, but a, a subsidiary of that, and then plug that into a, a stock recruitment model as a function of temperature, and that's actually pretty well estimated and projectionable, and then you link that to some of the, the spawning biomass benchmarks from this and make some projections as well. So we're beginning to, to include all that. We also have multi-species models, again, mainly emphasizing predation and how that changes things. One of them is an MSVPA um, that has a lot of arrows and critters in it, but uh, more importantly, uh, it, it's been through a formal review for one region and we've got plans for another review. And, and again, it, it's, it's a multi-year process to present these models, have people kick the tires, look under the hood, see how we need to adapt it, and then review not only the model, but then the application of the model to a particular situation. But here's probably one point, and this is for Atlantic mackerel. Um, what I can tell you is, is uh, M2, predation mortality, um, is age variant, it's time variant, and it's not point two. <laughs> so, never mind. Um, uh, the other thing, is we have a, a multi-species and aggregate production models, and we had a recent GARM uh, uh, process, groundfish assessment review, and, and really this is the same kind of a modeling approach as you would for single species, but we're doing it now for groups of species, ignoring the fact that they're species, but they're functionally similar or taxonomically similar or caught in the same gear, et cetera. And we've got a whole host of models that simulate and actually do fitting and provide context for other assessments and allow us to do scenario testing and we're beginning to include that in those assessments. And here's one example where you run the model, this model, and you get basically everybody kind of at their uh, carrying capacity or, or BMSY, whatever you want to call it. And you know there's some trophic partitioning. And then you go in and you whack uh, the pelagics, these critters, the planktivores, and not only do you get some compensation by uh, uh, shrimp amphipod eaters, which had some diet overlap, and the benthivores, which are sucking up some of the energy. More importantly, you forego yield for the entire system. And that's an important outcome of this that, that we begin to look at. Another approach is we've actually fit to uh, our catch and survey data um, of an aggregate model that we actually use in that context to answer the question, can you have BMSY? for 19 or 30 whatever stocks simultaneously, and what would the aggregate F, MSY, and BMSY be for those? And we're, we're fitting those. Uh, here's an example to show the, how the fit and the survey actually aren't too far off. Uh, another thing, we've, we've had a project that had uh, several energy budgets. We used uh, several um, uh, food web models. Uh, there's one famous out here, maybe you've heard of it, Ecopath, but there, there are a couple others, <laughs> love you Billy, um, the, uh, the uh, Eco Network and a couple others. And really, we actually use that as part of the GARM. We're building dynamic models off of this, and we're using this as part of our trade-off analysis. So you go in and you whack you know, a couple of these nodes, what happens to the rest of the energy in the system? How does it get redistributed? 10 minutes, okay. Um, and then also it helps us understand the structure and function and, and look at this uh, from a you know, static snapshot, but also building the dynamic to see where energy flows in terms of you know, a fairly simplistic uh, operating model in an MSE context. Um, the other thing that uh, Bill Overholtz and a, and a couple of us have done is we've taken the result from Emacs, we've made a, a, a 
homegrown dynamic model that actually goes through and, and uh, expresses all these different uh, relationships. It's a kind of a donor control approach, a little different than, than what is typically done. And we've gone through and we've tested you know, about 30 different scenarios and ranging from climate change to overfishing to simultaneous things, protected species and so on. And, and what we're doing with that is also setting this up to provide context for other things in a dynamic way so that we can then go back and, and test how different outcomes or scenarios would play out. Uh, the last one is Atlantis. Uh, these are full-blown <laughs> ecosystem simulations and Tony uh, mentioned this this morning so I won't go into too much detail. Um, we're, we're pretty well validated and those of you who've um, never used Atlantis, if, if you do choose to do that, there's a support group I recommend you. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, and then, uh, but more importantly, it's a systemic tool. Uh, we use it primarily uh, for strategic type things and, and, and there's about three or four levels of validation before you can get into the scenario testing and we're, we're just about there. But we're using it even in those calibrations or validations to do these vir virtual perturbations. And this is another operating model we would intend to use for MSE, primarily not only for EBFM, but EBM multi-sector. And, and this is the value of that approach. And here's our 30 boxes with our depth. And you can get the outputs and look at any particular place in the time trajectory look at you know all these things and then hit play and look at it you know 30 years later etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, we also are taking the empirical data that we have from our fishery dependent and independent information and our models and we're just trying to come up with creative ways to look at patterns and processes to determine how all this fits together and ultimately we're trying to define ecosystem overfishing uh, I don't know if we can, certainly we're not mandated to, but we might be mandated to at some point. And, and that's one of the things that, that keeps us going in this. So basically there's a lot of modeling efforts. We're working at all ends of this gradient. A lot of these are still R&D things, but some of them have actually been through a formal process, most of which are more towards a single species with additions to them. But the big point is we're still trying to take a look at things systemically all at once. And we're not as data limited as perhaps other parts of the world, but we've still, through this process, the data gap identification keeps showing up. That's been valuable. Um, so yeah, we're still developing stuff. Um, and this is a great uh, quote from the Spotted Out controversy out here. Make a joke about tasting like condor, but it might offend someone, so I won't say that. So, um, thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, the, uh, we're doing MSEs and marine uh, procedures, management procedures, and IAs, and basically everything I showed you the past few minutes is fair game for an operating model. And you know the observations, your objections, you plug it through this, particularly with the integrated assessments, and then how does it play out? What are your management's performance measures and so forth? And we're beginning to, as gently as we can, try to suggest this might be a way forward to get us off the assessment treadmill. Every year we have to do a bunch of assessments. Maybe we can slow down a bit. Uh, the other thing is we, we're really emphasizing education and outreach. We have uh, a glossy, uh, shiny glossy um, that uh, we've, we've published that has really been uh, useful to um, get everyone in the system to understand you know, just general principles ranging from stakeholders, uh, industry, and, and managers. Uh, the other thing, perhaps a little more technical, um, is we've got ecosystem advisory reports, ecosystem status reports, and these are on the order of 20 or 30 pages. We're, we're just now pulling these together to kind of highlight some quick hitting things, major forcers or drivers, major responses. Um, there is some socioeconomic outputs and then integrative measures and how all this ties together, trying to keep a quick hit, quick view and, and look at it from that unique kind of product perspective that you might typically get from, from a science angle. Um, Without going into too much detail, we have been engaging 
our two councils and our state commission at various committees, various formal and informal things. Uh, just a couple weeks ago, I gave a presentation at the Mid-Atlantic, and, and we're helping them develop fishery ecosystem plans. Uh, another thing is a marine resource education partnership. We go in with uh, about 30 uh, members of the fishing industry, uh, a few NGO folks, and we sit around a table very informally, and we just talk about these concepts. And I love that. It's been really valuable because it's non threatening. We're not making a decision. And it's just a way to share ideas and, and make those connections. It's been really valuable for us to interact with the industry that way. Um, and then more formally, we've had a ton of other meetings. And then our regional office as well, where we're really trying to establish some working groups, collaborations more formally that, that will keep this ball rolling. And then, you know, people that are smarter than us, we bring in to steal their ideas. So, um, uh, we just reorganized at our center less than a year ago. We developed this new program, and we did this to establish an integrated effort for all the things our center does. And, and you know, most science centers collect things from soup to nuts, oceanography, fish, protected species, everything. But, Oftentimes, it's a challenge to integrate those, and, and we've been really uh, fortunate to, to be able to do this here recently, a group to that end. And our goal is really to develop these products from an EVFM perspective uh, and to help people work together, but particularly to take this total system view than just a species-centric view. Um, so there's a lot we have left to do. Let me give you, how much time do I have? A couple minutes? Okay, thanks. Uh, let me give you some technical suggestions or plans that we have for implementation. One is if, if you're going to op optimize or change these stock assessments, I think predation mortality on forage species is a good place to make a lot of hay. And we're doing that. I think the other thing is exploring these environmental drivers on all the various things that can impact stocks is, as climate change begins to continue along is something that we're, we're exploring. And then the trade-offs among species, we're, we're trying furiously to stay you know, one step ahead of the curve to model all that stuff because uh, it's coming down. And then you know we're big advocates of not just D model but three or four models in, at one point to address a particular question as appropriate. And then the other thing is, is what do you do with this output? How do you handle strategic advice? I don't know. So we're, we're engaging stakeholders and partners to figure that one out. From an institutional perspective, I think what I've seen over the past five to six years is this MSE framework or approach really is, is a pretty good way to go. And then plugging in or, or producing in that process these integrated products, the stats report, IAs, et cetera. And then we're, we're realizing that we need to continue the outreach and engagement at levels, multiple levels than we have before, and working within the structures formally to do that. And then, I don't know if you can see it here, but in the Lord of the Rings, Gandalf says, keep it simple, keep it safe. <laughs> kind of. Um, but uh, we're trying to simplify this and keep it as simple as possible and keep it safe in that it's non-threatening, it's familiar, but a slight change. And I think there's value to that as opposed to we're gonna change how we do this wholeheartedly. Uh, and, and I think the odds for buy-in are a lot better if we follow Gandalf's advice here. So, um, so this is a great quote. Uh, I wish Detroit would remember this now. But, uh, um, let me conclude with this. Um, you know, we get all these mopping and all this complexity. I, I, I really, a firm believer, let's go with what we got. Let's keep it pragmatic and let's move forward.